You're listening to Help Me on the Comedian. It's a show where we ask a comedian to come in and share something difficult from their life and how they got through it and see if there's any insights for the rest of us. You're also joined in that endeavour by psychologist Dr. Rachel Hannum and comedian Daniel Holt. The story today is one about creating a good life for yourself, even when you've had a very difficult childhood. So to share that story, Daniel, hello. Hello. How are you going, everyone? I'm good, thanks. Hi, Can Daniel. You- can you tell us about your story and the childhood you grew up in? Yeah, of course. Uh, so essentially I grew up in Sheffield, England. Uh, it was one of, in one of the most poorest parts of the city with the highest crime rate. Uh, I was born in a council estate, uh, so it was yeah, government funded and everything like that. And I was uh, raised with a, mostly a single mother. So yeah, she suffered through depression, a lot of mental health problems uh, and raised four kids. I'm one of four. Um, my dad is... Um, uh, was never around. He was an abusive alcoholic. Um, he's a mixed race. So my dad's Indian and my mom's English. Uh, he had two kids, uh, myself and my older brother. Uh, and yeah, whenever he was around, he had a huge drinking problem. And yeah, he would be abusive to the family. So I grew up with family violence and domestic violence uh, growing up in that situation. Um, eventually, my mom moved away from my father because he wasn't a great role model, let's say. Uh, but ended up running back into trouble again with my stepdad, who was a racist. So didn't bode well for me being Indian. No. Um, I'll be honest, yeah, didn't go too well. So, Can we start with that story, growing up in the council estate and with your dad who wasn't around? Are there any specific stories that you can share that sort of paint a picture of what your life was like in that world? Yeah, so I grew up, uh, yeah, so in the council estate, essentially there was like no carpets on the floor. There was no uh, door handles, like literally, do you know, like the bare minimum? It wasn't there. Like say if I was to take uh, a bath, I'd have to take a butter knife with me just because like I'd get locked in. So you'd have to like open the door with a butter knife. Uh, And like we grew up so poor that like my mom would tell me my birthday is on a different day because she couldn't buy me any presents. And I'd be like, mom, I'm sure it's my birthday today. And she'd be like, no, it's another day. And I'd be like, oh, okay. Uh, After a few years, I kind of was like, it's definitely my birthday today. I'm sure about that. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, my father was never really around, like, uh, growing up. Uh, and I really struggled with that as a young kid because when people was with both parents or, uh, you know, having that family life, like you watch a Christmas movie and all the families around singing carols and everything, I didn't have that. I had the complete opposite. So it would, it used to bring me to tears a lot as a kid, like when I'd hear even the word father, um, until I got to know him, essentially, which he kind of came back into my life roughly when I was about 10, for a bit like my mom gave me a chance to finally meet him uh got in contact somehow like and then got to meet him and then I ended up meeting him and I remember meeting him um in the in the center of Sheffield like I ran up to him and he was like this big giant of a man and he lifted me up really high and I was like it's my dad and it was like it seemed like all my dreams of what a father would be in one moment until I got to know him until I got to know him then uh after a while like being around him you saw there was drinking habits even though, though I was young He'd always have, like, a bottle of alcohol next to him or he'd smell of alcohol. Uh, and when he, whenever he would drink, he would just be hugely aggressive. Like, uh, I remember a story once where we was all in bed. I was going to school the next day, and he tried to break in our house uh, just because he just wanted to come in and, like, like rule the house. Like, it's like he wanted to take control like he always did with my mom or family. Uh, and he, would, he was trying to break down the door, break down the door, and my mom was trying to trying to shout through the window, like, just go away, but she was too terrified because she knew if he got in, what would happen. So she was trying to ring the police. I went to the window to tell him to go away, and as I go to the window, I, I look down at him, and I'm like, can you... I never call him by dad. I call him by his name, uh, Armageet. So I was like, Armageet, can you go away? And he looked up, and he was like, which one are you? And he didn't know whether I was Tommy, his oldest son, or me. And I was like, I'm Dan, by the way. Uh, and yeah, can you still go away? Can you move on, sort of thing? But he was that drunk, he didn't know. And moving on later into life, I didn't really see him much anymore, but I'd be with my friends around about 18 in the city, you know, like when you first start going out and hanging around with friends and stuff. And I'd just walk past him and I'd be like to my friends, that's my dad. And he wouldn't even recognise me. Did not have a clue, just walked straight past. And I kind of lost, I don't, I don't have any connection to him anymore. Like I le- legit have no feeling of love, sadness, anger or anything. He's just kind of cut off. It's just like... Indifferent. Indifferent, yeah. There's no kind of emotion towards him. I remember at 19, I actually went to talk to him. So I was in a in a in like a 7-Eleven style shop uh, just getting some stuff. And then uh, my friend came in and he was like, don't go outside, your dad's outside. And I was like, oh, is he really? And uh, I was like, you know what? I'm actually going to go out and talk to him. I'm like, I'm 19 now. I was like, let's go out and see. And I went out to him and I was like, 
I kind of was being a bit, you know, forward. I was just like, you owe me money. And he was like, what? And I was like, you owe me money. And then he just started to snarl and get aggressive. And he came at me and he was basically wanting to fight me. He didn't know who I was until I said, oh, I'm Claire's son, my mom, Claire. And he was like, oh, you're my son. Oh, I love you so much and all this. And just switched to this endearing person that I knew he was not at all. And I was like, do you know what? I'm going to give you, you know, a chance to have your say. I've, I've seen what you've done. I've heard from my mom and my brother about what you've done. But, you know, I'll have a one-on-one conversation. So he was like, okay, cool. We, had, we walked away from the shop to a little park where it's just me, him, uh, and some random fella, like, who he knew. And I just said to him, right, can you just explain your story? Like, why you did what you did or who you are kind of as a person. I'll let you have a chance for once. And he started off the conversation by, okay, cool. So how it is, son, if women are out of line, you have to beat them in place. And I just went, whoa, stop right there. And that was enough for me to go, I don't want anything to do with you. I was like, that's enough for me. I was just literally was like, I will, nay, I'm never going to be anything like you. Every, your story, everything you've been about, you've lost me, you've lost mom, you've lost your family due to alcoholism or drugs or any negative you know like thing he's been involved in he's lost a lot of things and i was just saying i won't be a product of that uh like my brother was unfortunately my brother grew up with my dad more than me and he had to suffer through the abuse like my mom did with the family violence and him growing up it ended up affecting him to grow up and want to be a bigger man and uh, want to kind of defend himself from everyone in all aspects so he tried to be like the hard guy on the estate this is my brother hard guy in the estate, and he ended up becoming that. But in, in becoming the hard guy, he ended up becoming a drug dealer. He ended up becoming, yeah, got addicted to drugs to the point where he was addicted to heroin and still is to this day. And because of his childhood and dad affected him so much, he, he's like, like ruined my brother's life in a way. But in that moment where your dad started that conversation with that comment about beating women, mm-hmm. I imagine, or at some point, you just decided, I'm not going to be anything like this guy. Oh, 100%. I decided that from a young age, watching, like, my youngest memories are of domestic violence and family violence. And Do you me- remember having the thought, I'm not going to be like him? 100%. I remember seeing that and I was like, you just, even though you don't know as a child, you know that's wrong. And yeah. you can see how much it affects everyone. The, 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 there's tension in the room. There's, there's literally physical violence happening in front of you. The, the woman I love, like, my mom is being her. And I, was, I knew from a young age I never wanted to do that or follow that. And then to hear that, has like a young adult to go, that's how it's done. I, I knew as a kid that wasn't the way it's done. I also knew at that moment, that's the last I'll have to do with you. Uh, and I gave you your one shot and that's your start. That's your end with me, basically. Yeah. So, yeah, in that moment I knew that I'll, I'll never be like that. And you haven't seen him since? Not seen him since. Uh, at the moment I don't know if he's dead or alive or what he's doing, if he's causing more chaos or what he's doing. I have, I have no involvement with him at all. I barely, barely, yeah, I barely did anyways, but yeah. At this moment, not at all. Before we move on to the story and and talk about more about what you made of yourself from this childhood, can I also ask you about race? You mentioned being mixed race with Indian and British heritage. Was that a positive growing up? Did you suffer from racism on the estate? Tell us about that. Yeah, so like growing up, it's always been hard. Like you feel like you're not connected to any race. Like yeah, like growing up, um, yeah, there was racism on the on the estate I was at because you you're. you're tan kid you're brown you're different the majority of people in my area was white at the time so there was racism there uh, from people at school uh, people in the street and my brother would try and defend me from that or defend himself from that and that's what led him kind of down his path as well uh, but yeah there was racism growing up every day and I had to live with a racist every day so my stepdad who my mom did after my father uh, he, he uh, had two kids with my mom so I've got a younger sister and a younger brother and I spent around 10 to 15 years of my life kind of with him. He wasn't always there. He was kind of in and, in and out of our lives. But he was, um, he was super, extremely racist, yeah. Like, in, in what way? Can you give us some examples of the kind of things that you would hear? So, every, uh, so he was also physically violent. Some of my earliest memories are of him also abusing my mother uh, in front of me again. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he would be... Every time they get in an argument, he would always go at my mom with having kids that are of, uh, of a race, of being Indian. And he would always say racial slurs towards myself or my brother or my mom or uh, my mom who she dated or who she would get with. Uh, he, would always, he would always watch TV and if anyone of colour would be on TV, he would say racist stuff all the time. Uh, he hated me from the off. So, like, when I was younger, 
Um, I don't actually remember this, but I, like I, I grown up with a huge scar like on my cheek. It's more faded now, but the scar it went straight through. I can feel it on the other side of my cheek, and uh, I didn't know how I had that. Like how, how I grew up and got it. My mom always told me the cat did it. Charlie the cat, and I was like, it's a pretty strong cat. Let me tell you, is it like a Bengal tiger? If it's a cat, like it's a pretty strong cat. But I ended up talking to my brother, and he was in the room when it happened. And uh, it, it turned out that my stepdad had used a sharp object uh, to literally stab me in the cheek and rip, rip down uh, as a kid just because I'm Indian, just because I, I've, I'm half Indian, and for no other reason other than he hated that. Uh, and growing up... How I, old were you, Daniel? I must have been between uh, three to five, three to six. And you don't I, remember? I have no recollection. No. I just know I had a scar. And then growing up, I would, like, on the inside, it would, like, still heal or there were still issues with it. Now it's completely fine. Uh, but, yeah, like, I grew up with that. And I always wondered how I got that scar. Like, I was like, yeah, my mom would always try and... I think she was just trying to look after me by trying to tell me, you know, there's a different reason to what it was. She still, to this day, struggles to say exactly what it is. My brother told me upright. He went, I was in the room. I was still young, but I remember... He did something to your face. Uh, it was uh, we don't know what object, but it was enough to pierce through straight through my skin, through the other side, and rip down. Do you remember wishing that someone would come to protect you and your mum? Always, yeah. Mm. Always wish they would. Always wish they would, and always like dreamed that there would be someone to come in. You were hit with so much difficulty as a childhood. I know when I've spoken to Rachel in other episodes, we talk about adverse childhood experiences that are likely to result in poor mental health as an adult. And I think grief was up there. Mm -hmm. Um, The loss of a parent, divorce, these kind of things. You had strangulation from a parent. You were stabbed by a parent. You had racial abuse. You had just your whole identity criticized and mocked for for years. You're so positive now. You're a comedian. You're really upbeat. You're always smiling. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me before you got to that positive place, what kind of impact this childhood had on you? Can you think about, you know, the effects psychologically? Yeah, so growing up, uh, yeah, growing up, I definitely suffered with depression. Uh, depression and a feeling of, like, like feeling lost all the time. It's like I didn't have what everyone else had. Uh, you know, you'd be around friends and they have very normal families and very normal livelihoods. Uh, but I just always felt lost and always sad all the time. And I remember when I was younger, I'd always feel a lot of anger. Anger that would, yeah, be burn inside of me. And I was just um, really affected by this... Um, yeah, yeah, mentally because like I don't, I don't know. I, you can't really see a way how you can make things change and happen and whatnot. You were saying you didn't really feel like you fitted in either because being mixed race as well. So did you feel a bit sort of disoriented as well? Yeah, disoriented, lost. Just, uh, yeah, that feeling. You felt. I felt a lot of time. Yeah, a lot of time when I was younger, I felt super sad and down. And yeah, I'd say yeah, depression. Um, yeah. Were there things. people along the way though, or experiences or places? that protected you from some of this trauma? There must have been some factors in your life somewhere along the line Mm -hmm. for you to have been able to somehow rise above some of this trauma. Yeah, so a person would be my mom, super, super inspirational mother. She wasn't perfect. She, of course, made some bad choices that would affect herself and not only herself, the family as well. You know, um, but, of course, domestic violence and and everything else is going to affect my mom. Uh, but also, she was always there for me. Always there, always positive, uh, even in the tough times. Always believed in what I, I could do. Mm. She was very free and she'd kind of, I want to I wanna rule the world. You want to rule the world, you can do what you want, son. You can do, you can do it if you want. Very encouraging. She, very encouraging. Yeah. Even though she didn't have the financial means, I've never grown up with any, any financial means to support my dreams. She always was there, like, in spirit and also there to have, like, a conversation with. Um, also, uh, my, I'm very proud of my sister. Even though my sister at a young age got very affected from all this childhood trauma, uh, she did have, like, three kids around about 20. So she was an underage teenage parent. Uh, but she changed her life around when she had kids. She was looking to go on the same path as what, essentially, my brother was going and, and what many people in our estate was going. But she changed her life around, and now she's looking after three kids. She's studying, she's working and whatnot. So I'm very proud of what she's achieved as well also, yeah. And even though my older brother, um, heroin addict, uh, in and out of prison, uh, not the perfect character, he always uh, instilled in me a sense of belief that you can do whatever you want. Mm. He didn't want me to follow the same path. He didn't set a great example, 
Uh, but he never wanted me to follow what he did. So still a lot of camaraderie between the siblings yeah. and with your mum, a lot of solidarity there. Between us, yeah, between the people that was affected, yeah. yeah. It was there, like, it's, that, that's all you've got in, in mm. times of uh, hopelessness is belief. Like, it can change, it will change, and, you know, like, it doesn't matter if your finances are there or if people can do many things for you, you can always do things yourself uh, by believing in yourself mm. and by pushing forward with... Were there any teachers or extended family or friends as you got older who also would constitute protective factor in your life? Uh, I I did surround myself with good friends. Mm. Uh, I purposely wanted to hang around with people that had more ambition than I did or, like, what I had. Like, I was always an ambitious person, but hang around with the right crowd. Like, it's so easy at school to get carried away with the wrong people. You know, it seems really cool. It seems like the place to be, you know, do that. But I've seen where it starts and how it ends. So I essentially wanted to surround myself with people that wouldn't go that direction. So even at an early age, I was trying to make the good friend choices or the best friend choices I could. And I met a good group of people that was trying their best in the situation to make make well, how we grew up change to be something better, essentially. Yeah. So yeah. they were a positive influence on you? Positive influence on me. Mm. And I, I didn't have many positive influences growing up. I would take it from... Not the usual places, I'd say. Like, I legit um, would watch movies. For example, Lord of the Rings. Uh, Massive fan of Lord of the Rings. When I say that, it sounds quite funny because you think of wizards, dwarves and elves. But I'd watch movies like that and the moral morals in the the film, the moral compass of uh, fellowship, bond. You know, they travel around Middle Earth. Perseverance. Perseverance, not giving up. Like, I, I didn't have a male role model to follow. I didn't have any model to follow, really, except for who I wanted to be and who, where I wanted to go. And you take it from, it can be from a book, it can be from a movie. If you haven't got that in, like, as mm. a person, sometimes you don't. You can take it from a, a sort of character of TV. Like, uh, if, they, if, they, if they look like somebody that you, you feel has uh, great intentions and, like, people you can aspire to, you can aspire to mm. anything you want, really. You're listening to Help Me, I'm a Comedian. I'm Ashwin Sedgar, and you've also been hearing from comedian Daniel Holt and psychologist Dr Rachel Hannum. Rachel, when you're hearing Dan's stories... This could have gone very badly for him, those kind of experiences. Can you talk about the kind of effects those childhood experiences can have on a person? Yeah, absolutely. And that's absolutely right. It could have gone so differently. That's why I'm really fascinated by, um, you know, this notion of what we talk about in psychology is the protective factors, the things that um, allow a person to triumph over adversity and even grow after the trauma has subsided. So this term post-traumatic growth. Um, Intelligence is another one. Do you consider yourself a fairly intelligent person, Daniel? I would say uh, emotionally intelligent, yeah. Uh, Yeah, and that's actually even more predictive Mm -hmm. than IQ. Yeah. Emotional intelligence, Mm -hmm. uh, which is strongly uh, sort of genetically influenced, is a big predictor of resilience and post-traumatic growth. Do you think you have grown as a result of, like, has it given you wisdom? Has it given you compassion in some ways going through these experiences? A hundred percent, yeah. Like, I've, I've seen some of the worst things you can you can maybe ever see, you know? And, uh, and in, yeah. in that, like, you're going to see, you're going to see moments where, the, yeah, you, you, you know not to follow it. You, you know, you know deep inside it's wrong. Like, and you feel a sense of, I'm not going to be this. I'm not going to follow this. And feel sorry for the victims of what happened. I'm a victim myself of it, but it's weird because I don't like to see myself that way. I like yeah. to see myself as somebody who's as the victor, as the victor <laughs> in the end of it. Yeah, like like you can go through something and you can come out the other end, and yes, and and you can take these things and as negative as they are, you can put them forward like I, like I'm doing now in a positive message to help others. Like in anything that's happened to me negatively, I've always tried to change it around to be like, okay, cool, this happened, uh, but how can we how can we use it to give you more drive or change the world in some way or help someone else uh, in another way. So it, it teaches you a lot of intelligence emotionally. Yeah, maybe mentally you would say. To me yeah. it seems normal. as like I just kind of grew up in that way. But um, I always oh, you always have to work on yourself 100%. Like yeah. in these situations, you can't just... You can't just change like that. It's not a magic potion or a pill or anything. It's, it's a just, long journey. It's a long journey of like changing and working on yourself. Can I ask if it's affected your romantic relationships in any way, shape or form? Uh, no, because I've seen exactly how it shouldn't be. Yes. And that's exactly what I won't do. It's the same as like my, my dreams to have a family and kids and be a father because I've never, 
I don't know what that's like. I don't mm. know what it's like to shave your beard or have your, your father to put aftershave on your be a man around the house. I don't know how that all is, so I'm looking forward to that. Mm. Uh, but uh, romantically, I, I know exactly what you shouldn't do. Yeah, I've not been shown like what a normal relationship is like, for sure. Uh, I've seen how a negative one can go. You know what not to do, though. Know what not to do, mm. yeah. Can, you know I, what to do. can I pick up on that idea? Because it's this golden rule that people talk about, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I think the... Chinese version of that, the Confucian version is don't do unto others what you would not have them do unto you. They start negatively. It's like your whole life has mm. been almost negative. You know what you don't want to do. You know, what you, you know where you don't want to be, not necessarily what you should emulate. Is that a good way to, is that a healthy way to live your life by what you don't want rather than what you do want or any cost to it? Well, I often say to my clients, have both lists at the front mm. of your mind, you know, when they're looking, say, when they're dating, you have your list of what you don't want and your list of what you do want. But I was really interested in what you said, Daniel, about as a kid, you would go into your room in the dark and sit and in your imagination, try and visualise or manifest what you did want for your life and who you mm. did want to be. I think you've just spontaneously cottoned onto something mm. there that's, you know, part of quite a few sort of therapies, mm-hmm. which is to uh, use that adverse experience that kind of pushed you in this direction of creative visualization, you know, imagining, exposing yourself imaginally to a different, better uh, way of being. And yeah, the fact that you did that quite spontaneously does show your emotional intelligence, even as mm-hmm. a kid. One of the biggest skills a good parent has is emotional self-regulation, which neither your father nor your stepfather had. In fact, they used drugs and alcohol to self-soothe and self-regulate, and we all know the pain that that leads to. Mm -hmm. So if parents can avoid substance abuse and learn how to emotionally self-regulate, everything else is going to flow from that. How do we emotionally self-regulate? What are some tips? So, I mean, in relationships, uh, once your endocrine system has started pumping out those stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol... You're you're at risk of of aggression and rage and and even violence, which is what you were on the receiving end of, Daniel. Um, So I teach my clients to catch themselves early before they're too emotionally flooded with these stress hormones and practice mindfulness, mindful breathing, grounding, maybe take themselves away. You know, we often put toddlers in timeout. I tell parents to put themselves in timeout Mm -hmm. (laughs) if they can um, because we need to buy ourselves time to come back to calm. And since you're a comedian, I'll also... I'm with two comedians here. I'll also mention that using Mm humour in relationships is such a great strategy for diffusing the tension when there's conflict. Mm -hmm. If you can lighten the moment with your partner or with your child when there's conflict by finding the absurd, finding the funny, taking some of the stress out of it through humour is a a really good tactic. So you'll be a great dad. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. (laughs) I, I completely agree with that with uh, using humor, like during difficult situations. So essentially I found myself, I didn't know it at the time, but being sort of a comedian for the family. So essentially if moments where it get really serious and heated and, you know, it's going to kick off, I try and diffuse it. And once it calmed down, I, I'd love to do, um, have you seen the movie The Mask? Yes. Do you know what I mean? Like, do, like he walks really funny, does like really long strides. I just get up and do like little mini performances. For physical humor. Physical humor. Um, sometimes even, yeah. The situation was dark, but, you know, finding the funny in there just to relieve the tension and seeing my mom go to a point where it's like she's scared to it's calm down to making a laugh mm. was one of the best things I loved. Like, yes. fi- like my mom's laugh, I'll never, ever forget growing up. And like, like that inspires me to be, want to be a comedian now because I love just making people laugh. Like, you know, people come to the comedy shows and they can be gone through anything in their day. Mm. It reminds me of that moment when I was a kid and I'd make my mom happy in a moment of real you know like in real that was one of the few things you could do for her because you were just a kid yeah just a kid yeah and it's just breaking that tension and taking away from that little moment of yeah this is reality what you went through might put some person into years of therapy and needing Mm -hmm. help you've addressed it with a positive attitude pick me up kind of ambition and attitude and you took up boxing for a while and you've got comedy in your life Mm -hmm. but are there any 
legacies of that childhood that you haven't quite dealt with that might be a blind spot for you now because someone else has to point them out who's looking from the outside like a girlfriend or a therapist. Are there any habits? Are you like, are you jumpy? Um, do you struggle with people pleasing or wanting to make everyone laugh because it worked for your mum? Are there any legacies of that childhood that you still need to address, you think? Yeah, there's definitely stuff I want to work on. Yeah, and there always is. Like, there's no way that I'm, I've just uh, magically been p- positive and everything's perfect. But yeah, the, the one thing that affects me a lot is just, uh, I would say the most, is the fact that I had no control to stop it all from happening. Mm. Uh, and I um, find myself, uh, I, I daydream a hell of a lot, <laughs> let's say. And I, d- I d- uh, daydream a lot. And especially about these moments about, like, I would say, yeah, like changing them. Maybe uh, probably like one thing that affected me is like getting revenge back. Mm. You know, like mm. getting revenge back and like got, like on my stepdad and my dad getting revenge, and that's probably one of the biggest negatives that I have is like I want to be like not do the same as what they did, but you know, like show like like get revenge to go like to give you it's like some maybe some element of power. Back. Power because you were yeah, so powerless. So powerless. You're watching your mother, who you loved, being threatened and beaten and hurt and you can't yeah. do anything it's so yeah. horrible but the the area of power you can get back is by, by being successful that's the way but my way of going uh okay this this is how i wouldn't say to beat them but my my way of getting power back is by going i'm not going to be anything like you i will i'll not i'll not be a an aggressive drunk that beats up their kids and family i will not be you know, racist. I'll not be. I'll not be any part of them. That's the way of me beating them by by being successful. That's uh, the way. These to change thoughts it. of revenge that you just talked about are mm-hmm. they intrusive thoughts? Do they kind of just pop in, or do you manufacture them deliberately? They, they pop in. They pop in a few times. Yeah, they pop in, and they, they can pop in when I, I maybe have a conversation with someone. And like, I always like to meet someone. I'm like, lovely to meet you. Be friendly. Uh, you can be what you want to be. And then uh, sometimes when I meet someone who's let's say not so nice from the off, they want to put you down. And all this stuff that does get at me. That's probably that comes back to I reckon my childhood, where it's like, why be like that? Why why put people down? Like you, like they deserve, like they they don't deserve that. Like so, kind of an element of like revenge in that sense. Mm. I'd say that's probably one thing I'd want to work on myself. But the the best part I would say with that element is putting that negative, like of like right, I want to show everyone like that 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 uh, you know uh, that revenge in a way. I, you put it into a positive by changing your life around and going, I'm not going to be anything like you guys. Like uh, I'm going to try and be a successful person, and what you what you did when I was younger, I won't be the 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 repeat of that. Let's say that's probably the one negative I'd say I'd take from that. Yeah, like sometimes I'll, I'll have uh, intrusive daydreams of like revenge and wanting to fight back and defend my mom or defend people that you know, I mean, defend myself in those moments. But yeah, like, I mean, there's a natural protest in a child going through something like that. Natural sort of anger and defense that wants to kick in uh, the fight that wants to kick in but mm-hmm. you can't you can't fight mm-hmm. a big drunk man when you're a little kid yeah. and so that fight energy kind of has nowhere to go um and so there's a theory that you know it's still in there somewhere that fight energy and it's interesting that it comes out just occasionally in mm-hmm. these moments yeah and i just want to say one thing that might come back to you later about it's almost like you've rebelled by being good and kind and gentle. That's your <laughs> that's a rebellion. That's your yeah. rebellion. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The thing about rebellion, uh, which is wonderful, I was a real rebel as a teenager, is that when we rebel against our childhood experiences by saying, I'm going to be nothing like that, in a sense, psychologically, we're still subject, subject to the same thing. We can either mm-hmm. conform or or rebel, Mm -hmm. but it's still those memories or experiences that have got the power over us. It's Mm -hmm. quite a thing to extract out, like just those intrusive thoughts tell me maybe there's still, Mm -hmm. it's still a mental object that you rebel against, but Mm -hmm. sometimes it grabs hold of you. Mm -hmm. And so the work is to kind of unhook from that thing being the um, influence, either conformity or rebellion you know, one day you won't have those intrusive thoughts. Yeah, I think I think it's like defending the the little guy or the defending little defending the little yeah, it's, guy. It's defending the, the person. Yeah, it's like yeah. the same. Like yeah, my mom didn't had no one to defend her. I didn't. Yeah. It's, if I see the same process again, it's always yeah. like I always feel like I want to be at the defense of somebody who doesn't have that. It's powerless. Yeah, it's powerless. Yeah. yeah. So you hate watching bullying now. I hate watching bullying. I hate that sort of behavior mm. in general. I just I I believe it's it's weak. 
from here on out. Like, I want to take the reins and move into fatherhood and everything else and enjoy it my way with a more positive outlook to life and, and everything else, yeah. You've been listening to comedian Daniel Holt and psychologist Rachel Hammond. Thank you to you both for coming in. Thank you very much. Thank you.